Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the discussion on Ukrainian digital resistance to Russian aggression, which is a joint event uh, of the German Council on Foreign Relations and our partner Strategy East. My name is Alona Epifanova. I'm research fellow in the International Order and Democracy Program at DJIP, and I'm delighted to be in the chair of this discussion. Um, today, we have a very distinguished panel of experts, uh, each of whom has great expertise uh, in the topic of the discussion, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. Uh, first, uh, Anatoly Motkin, uh, founder and president of Strategy East and our partner for this discussion today. He is a technology investor with uh, many, many years of experience in uh, political consulting and media entrepreneurship uh, in Eurasia. He started as a political consultant uh, both in Israel and in the Eurasian region and later moved from politics to media and helped to start one of the leading Russian language media companies in, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, Mr. Motkin uh, served as an advisor and investor to both the public and private sector uh, by uh, backing a number of Israeli IT projects and also developed in the high technology park in Belarus. Natalia Dinikeva, uh, she is director of the IT industry development uh, department <clears throat> and head of the DSDT project office of the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. She is working on transforming Ukraine into the largest European IT hub, as she said. This transformation goes by launching a unique tax and legal space for IT companies with low taxes, flexible employment condition for IT specialists, tools for investment. Um, and her team uh, is working on stimulating development of IT in Ukraine by covering all industries need. She also leads the development and implementation of the IT generation project, which will help thousands of Ukrainians to study for free and get a profession in IT. So a lot of work for Natalia. And um, last but not least is so my colleague Tyson Parker is today with us. Um, he's head uh, of the Technology and Global Affairs Program at TJP. He previously worked at Aspen, Germany, where as Deputy Executive Director and Fellow, he was responsible for the Institute Digital and Transatlantic Programs. Uh, before that, uh, Tyson served in numerous positions, including as Senior Advisor in the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs at the US State Department and Director for Transatlantic Relations at the Bettelsmann Foundation. Tyson um, widely published and comments in, in leading journals and media. So check out the GAPI website for his publication and comments. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. It's great to have you here. Um, and I see uh, our guests are still joining, uh, but I think we can start already. And before uh, we start with a presentation of a report on, on, on the Ukrainian digital uh, resistance to Russian aggression, and discuss uh, that and, and current developments in Ukraine. Uh, let's go to uh, Mikhail Fedorov, uh, Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, with some opening remarks on, on Ukraine's digital development. Um, so Julia, uh, could you please help us with, us, with that? Greetings. I'm grateful to German Society for Foreign Policy, DJP, and Strategy Center for New Economy for organizing this event and the opportunity to talk about the process in the digital sphere of Ukraine. Before the war, Ukraine was actively digitizing. Our ambitious goal was to transform Ukraine into the most convenient country for citizens and businesses. In two years, we have launched almost 80 online services on the DR portal and 12 documents in the mobile application. We have introduced the world's first digital passport, which is the same as the standard document. We also launched the world's fastest business registration on the DR portal. Among the implemented projects is also DR City, a unique tax and legal space for IT that provides one of the best conditions in Europe for developing technology businesses. Digital technologies have been our tools to make people's and businesses' lives better. Now technology is our weapon. Since the invasion, the Ministry of Digital Transformation has mobilized all its resources to fight the enemy on the digital front. We formed the IT army, which has already joined about 
300,000 cyber specialists of different skills from whole world. We also launched eight for Ukraine crypto fund. With its support, we have raised more than $60 million in crypto assets for the support of the armed forces of Ukraine and humanitarian aid program. I want to thank all countries and companies that support Ukraine in this difficult time and donate millions of dollars. Another of our goals is to ensure that technology companies stop businesses in Russia now. I believe that the duty of every company is to express their position and to condemn all the atrocities committed by the Russian military against the Ukrainian people and exit the Russian market. Therefore, I once again call on the global technology companies that have stayed in Russia not only to leave this country, but also to expand their work in Ukraine. You have the power to help us defeat the evil. And of course, we are deeply proud of Ukrainian IT. Companies and IT specialists are the real heroes of our economic front line. Despite the war, Ukrainian companies proved to be reliable partners. Ukrainian companies fulfill 95% of contracts. I call on all our international partners to continue cooperation with Ukrainian IT companies. Today, Ukraine is bravely fighting for the future, the democratic values and freedoms of the whole civilized world. We must win this war together. I'm sure our victory is close and Ukraine will become even stronger and more successful. Thanks for your efforts to help us win. Glory to Ukraine. Now I'm glad to, uh, to pass the floor to Anatoly Motkin, uh, who will present the report on Ukraine's digital resistance and its key funding. I highly recommend to read the report. We will uh, post it in the chat uh, right now. And I think it's a great overview of numerous initiatives and activities uh, which Ukraine introduced uh, to maintain its digital infrastructure, to help refugees to support its uh, IT industry and army and much more. Um, and Anatoly, uh, the floor is yours. The idea of the report was actually we uh, we look after what uh, uh, happens with the digital sphere and sector in Ukraine for a long time. And also we had some uh, collaboration initiatives with the Ministry of Digital Transformation. And at some stage on March, uh, we decided actually to summarize uh, what has been done by the ministry uh, to uh, resist the Russian aggression, but also uh, what is the role of this ministry in uh, supporting and developing the uh, IT industry in the country as one of the most resilient uh, sectors of uh, Ukrainian, uh, I, I couldn't say even economy, because I think it's a, it could uh, even be compared to what is done by the Ukrainian military. Um, and uh, with that, we decided to, uh, to collect some stuff and also to check that our uh, I, that our work was precise, so we also checked it with the ministry, and we, we've been supported by the ministry and by Natalia in, in, in these uh, studies. And uh, we thought that it will also be fair to attract attention to this report uh, from the international uh, community and also from the think tanks uh, to, to understand what is the role uh, in overall resistance or and resilience uh, of Ukraine uh, to, to the aggression. Um, now, we, uh, we understand that there are two parts of a digital activity in the country these days, uh, the, the, the open one and the hidden one. So we, 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 we dealt, we, we were dealing with the, the, uh, the public part of, of this activity. And I think even in that part is uh, sufficient. I think the second one will be revealed after the ceasefire and the end of war. Um, so, uh, have you got it, uh, Elena, uh, to your email, the, the presentation? Yes, we do, okay, okay. but somehow uh, my colleagues uh, still didn't have their uh, attachment, so I'm, I need maybe 30 seconds more. Okay, sure, sure, but I just wanted to be sure. So, it's so basically, <clears throat> the... Uh, 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 this report, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, maybe with the beginning. So what does what is IT industry in Ukraine today? So in 2021, 250,000 Ukrainian IT engineers uh, delivered about 7 billion or even I think uh, about $7 billion in expert earnings uh, for Ukraine. And it's about 10% of all experts of the country, including metals and all other stuff that the Ukraine exports, in the, including, uh, including the agriculture. 
the process of government digital transformation is underway. And the, by the presidential state in the smartphone program, and we remember that it was one of the first and maybe uh, among several successful initiatives uh, from President Zelensky. After the Russian invasion began, the Ministry of Digital Transformation gave preference to projects repelling the aggression. First, measures to enhance national digital resilience have been taken. Second, launched hundreds of applications supporting civilians and army. And the third one, implemented a number of initiatives to reinforce, yeah, uh, so basically the, the first slide, thank you for this, and we could uh, switch to the, yeah, uh, to, to that one. So uh, then implemented a number of initiatives to reinforce IT industry, uh, etc. And we will uh, we'll, uh, talk more about this initiative uh, that was declared just the last week. And I think that, uh, um, a, a, that Natalia could tell uh, more about this. Next slide, please. So basically, this uh, quote from Minister uh, Fedorov, while the Ukrainian army is heroically defending the uh, motherland on the battlefield, uh, the main task of the ministry is to create a reliable digital backend, which they are doing. Next slide, please. So digital resilience. Global tech giants such as Amazon, Apple, Google, and many more, uh, many, many others have joined the digital embargo on Russia. And it's important because uh, I, Russia is not technologically advanced, advanced countries, we know. And with this embargo, we uh, limit even more uh, their ability uh, for their aggressive actions against Ukraine, and not only against Ukraine. And they, it's true that many companies joined this embargo, but unfortunately, some of them still are keep working in Russia. And they, and I think that they will, they, they will have to join this embargo shortly. The Starlink access and terminals provided by Elon Musk, but I, it's important to stress that it's not only about terminals. He also shifted part of his fleet uh, of satellites uh, to cover Ukraine. And it was extremely important for Ukraine, especially these days, when uh, some of their infrastructure and uh, some of their infrastructure uh, was destroyed by Russians and the people lost their access to the internet and also not talking about the, 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 the army. Almost 500,000 volunteers joined IT Army and the Internet Army, and it's not only Ukrainians, it's international initiative, and it's also extremely, uh, extremely supportive of, what, uh, of uh, Ukrainian ability to resist. Next slide, please. Fundraising and mobilizing international assistance. So Ukrainian crypto fund raised over $60 million, being the biggest crypto donations drive so far in history. And it's true, and uh, many people uh, donated uh, from abroad and those who are in Ukraine, but I think mainly is those who support Ukraine from uh, many, many other countries. Meta History NFT Museum was launched to preserve the memory of wartime events and raise funds in support of Ukraine. And it's important to preserve those uh, memories. And also, it's, uh, I think it would be a good way to sell this NFT. I think the first NFT was sold uh, just uh, uh, another week. And uh, it provided also some funding to, for Ukraine. And PayPal launched operations in Ukraine. It's also it first, the first country in Eurasia and the only country in Eurasia where PayPal started uh, their operations. But also, it allows to many people to donate and to support Ukraine uh, financially on one side. On the other side, uh, many uh, refugees got ability to get their uh, money from their relatives and from other people who are interested to support. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Supporting the IT industry. So alone reduced the tax burden was adopted on top of the DS City. And DS City is a, a unique a tax regime for a, a IT companies in Ukraine that is supposed first to uh, scale up uh, investments into IT sphere in the country. Second, uh, many companies who are still in a, let's call it a gray zone, where their employees were uh, hired as a, a contractors are able to register all their employees and to get the same tax conditions as they used to. Uh, IT Nation training program was developed to support 3,000 Ukrainians in switching to IT. This program was initiated by Minister Fedorov, and uh, I believe Natalia could tell them, uh, say more about this. And it's important that uh, partially it has been supported by international donors, and I believe that uh, more support is, is required. And uh, I'm convinced that they, it, uh, they will obtain the support. Next slide, please. So uh, supporting the army, Ivorok, Stop Russia, Warbot, and Bachu platform and budget in Ukrainian is IC, 
platform launched to report armed forces of Ukraine on the movements of enemy troops. UA veteran boat created to support the combatants and their families in searching ammunition and humanitarian aid, which is also extremely important these days. And function of controlling the combat UAV Bayraktar added to the Ukrainian government app for electronic public services, but uh, only as a mini game. Uh, so it's not that any Ukrainian could bomb Russians in any given moment. And supporting civilians. And here it's also uh, uh, important to, to uh, demonstrate those platforms. Uh, Idopomo platform and humanitarian aid portal were created to organize the process of collecting and distributing humanitarian aid. A raid siren uh, app released to alert users about civil defense arms, and unfortunately we know that we have many of these. And Mariupol now status, maybe these days, unfortunately, it's less relevant, but the uh, fighting days when part of the city was occupied and par other pa uh, part of the city was still controlled by Ukraine, I, this bot launched to provide the resi residents of partly occupied Mariupol with relevant information on the current situation in the city. Gathering evidence of war crimes. The DOCAS and its a proof in Ukrainian portal launched to collect evidences of crimes committed by Russian military forces. And platform Maya Vina, My War, allows the Ukrainians to describe their personal experience during the war and to tell about the war crimes they witnessed. It's important because we need to, and the, we need Ukraine, the world needs, uh, to uh, have all these uh, witnesses uh, for the future tribunals and for future uh, courts against uh, those who made crimes in on Ukrainian uh, land, Ukrainian soil. Please. So uh, the last one, the policy recommendations. So for international financial institutions and global development agencies, we really recommend to support a large scale educational program, which aims to create 3000 new jobs in Ukrainian IT industry, the IT nation. We should remember that it's not only about IT specialists and not only about uh, creating 3000 jobs. According to our studies in all countries, each IT specialist generates five more jobs in non-related sectors. It's one more text driver, one more construction builder. It's one more uh, maybe white restaurant. So it's overall positive impact on the economy. And when we see that the physical infrastructure is heavily hit by Russian bombings and shelling, we understand that the digital infrastructure is more resilient. And it's our way also to create new jobs, to get new money into the country that will work for all sectors of the local economy. For global tech companies to join the sanctions imposed by Western countries on Russia, continue to consider Ukraine as a trusted IT vendor and open access uh, to their services to citizens of Ukraine. And the last one for the foreign government or institutions to support DIA as a platform, as an EGOP platform, and to simplify the documentation flow with Ukraine by recognizing Ukrainian digital documents. We know that on this collaboration, also UK assisted a lot to uh, have a copy of Ukrainian archives in the, for the case that Russians will hit them. And this kind of digital uh, collaboration between the governments is also not less important. Thank you. We got some comments and questions. We will um, get to them a bit later. Um, um, I would like to ask Natalia first um, uh, to comment. So how Ukraine has reached that level of, of digital resistance that Anatoly just described, and this, uh, which is one of the uh, key um, outputs of their report, of their research, and uh, also what are the main reasons why Ukraine's IT sector has been able to hold its ground since the war started? Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alana. Uh, you see, in fact, that the war in Ukraine has been going uh, on for almost eight years now, and Russia attacked us back in 2014 and occupied part of our territories. So all this time, Ukraine has been defending itself, was trying to defend uh, itself in all possible fronts. And uh, during this time, Ukraine was trying to build a strong cyber defense and successfully deals with the enemy in uh, cyberspace. Of course, not only just a state, a lot of people, a lot of businesses, a lot of participants uh, helped us to, uh, to be strong. And, uh, that's very helped us, uh, as well as uh, that uh, for the past two years, uh, our focus was uh, uh, our focus has been uh, placed on the becoming a digital state. So it makes perfect sense that since the full scale invasion, the Ministry of Digital Transformation uh, has mobilized all its resources to fight the enemy on the digital front. 
So basically we used all the possible means to defend our land and people. And we have very strong motivation and believe that tech is uh, the best solution against tanks and missiles. Uh, we started the campaign to pressure tech giants to cut off Russia on the same day, uh, the first explosion rocket Kiev. And the, our minister, Mikhail Fedorov, used Twitter to reach the companies. We uh, sent personal, uh, hundreds of personal uh, emails and letters to technology companies and institutions to ask them to leave and stop uh, operating in Russia. We received, by the way, we uh, received immediate support from many, many world uh, known companies such as Apple, PayPal, as Anatoly mentioned, Visa, MasterCard, Microsoft, Starlink, as Anatoly mentioned as well. So we really did a lot uh, to, to be strong and our previous experience since 2014 helped us a lot as well. Something like this. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, let's turn to Tyson. Um, Tyson, I remember that a couple of weeks after the war started, you published a very good piece on Russia's wartime cyber campaign. Um, could you please um, outline for us so what, what are the main risks uh, coming from Russia for Ukraine's digital domain? You see also now um, during, um, during the next phase of the war and how good is the country prepared for it? And maybe also how could the West support Ukraine in mitigating these risks? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think that everybody was a little bit surprised uh, at the uh, ineffectiveness of a Russian cyber operations uh, in the early out state, uh, early phase of the war. I mean, there were a couple of incidents that kind of predated the the hot phase of this part of the war. Uh, we we know about the defacement of uh, seventy government websites, the DDoS attacks on on banks and the MOD, Hermetic Wiper, uh, which was detected by several cybersecurity uh, uh, firms, including Microsoft. Uh, but generally, uh, the Viasat attack, et cetera, but generally it has not had the kind of uh, systemic impact that I think many were expecting. And that's a demonstration of all the hard work that the Ukrainians have done in the interim period between uh, 2014 uh, to, this, to now uh, and the learning process that they've had uh, related to disruptive attacks on the electricity grid in 2015, on the, ele uh, on the election system, uh, et cetera and the support that they're getting from uh, their partners and allies in the West. And you know, one thing that we can point to for sure is the very first deployment uh, in the uh, PESCO, uh, the, you know, the EU's kind of uh, national or security um, cooperation framework was to support Ukraine's uh, technical assistance on cybersecurity, but also the uh, Cybercom and the NSA have been quite active. And there was an interview in Sky News on June 1st from Paul Nicosoni, who's the head of both, uh, who basically said that, you know, was very honest and said uh, that the United States is using the full spectrum of its, uh, its instruments, offensive, defensive, and information operations to support Ukraine, which basically means the United States doctrinally, it seems, does not uh, see the kind of regulatory concerns uh, in cyber that it sees in other domains of this conflict. And that means that both from a government standpoint with the United States, EU and, and European member states, but also from the private sector, companies like Microsoft, like Symantec, et cetera, are, are providing their full scale of, of assets to support Ukraine in this conflict. Um, the, the big question in this area is, you know, what comes next? Uh, Russia has uh, clipped the wings of some of its, uh, you know, malware that it doesn't kind of cascade across the globe. We saw a little bit of that with Viasat and, and uh, wind turbines in Germany, for example. The, the Viasat attack uh, disabled or disrupted about 5,000 wind turbines in Germany, but we, didn't, we haven't seen the kind of uh, cascading attack like we saw in 2017 with NotPetya. Uh, where you know this ransom, this wiper disguised as ransomware really hit the global uh, IT infra global IT infrastructure, including causing about eight percent of the global damage in Germany itself. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen with Russia in the next phases of this conflict. So there needs to be vigilance. Uh, this is a persistent threat. Um, 
Russia itself is quite strained because it's trying to keep itself online. It is itself uh, the subject of many offensive cyber attacks. And let's be honest, the, the big issue with cyber is not necessarily the disruptive attacks, the information attack, the spying. It's the physical infrastructure. So Russia is, of course, attacking IT infrastructure yeah. kinetically in uh in Ukraine, and it's it's the IT specialists that uh, you have, you know, in on your bench. And Russia itself is losing many of its IT specialists. So uh, the the cyber landscape looks cautiously optimistic, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still threats on the horizon. Thanks so much, Tyson. And it's actually a very good bridge to my next que question to Anatoly. Um, I wanted to ask you so how the war impacted uh, the U Ukrainian IT specialists and uh, startups and which economic challenges Ukraine's IT companies are facing now. So basically a, a couple of uh, challenges. First of all, uh, many of the Ukrainian IT companies serve uh, international clients like um, and customers like uh, Boeing, like, uh, like uh, Airbus, like Amazon and others. And uh, on one hand, they're supporting uh, Ukraine uh, in the Ukrainian fight, uh, fight for its freedom. On the other side, uh, they want to be sure, uh, and the big companies support it, but some small clients are afraid that they, they could not get maybe delivery on time or for other concerns. Some of them uh, consider relocating the development to other countries. And that's something that we're opening uh, and supporting the initiative to uh, what we call to convince them that Ukraine is still trusted IT destination and they will get all the delivery in time. So the challenge is actually to keep the customers, to keep the customers as uh, developing and uh, even scaling up uh, their development in uh, development in Ukraine. The second challenge is uh, for the product companies. Some of them were expecting to get some investments from uh, from foreign investment funds, and these investments were uh, were frozen uh, for a while, and uh, some of them really struggled to survive. So I think that the initiative to set up a kind of fund of funds uh, that the Ukrainian government will support these product companies is important because many of them uh, have a good opportunity to break up and to become uh, to, uh, to become uh, global companies and to to bring in more and more. Uh, revenues to Ukraine, but now they should be supported. And that's something that they also, the government of Ukraine supported by international donors should do. Thank you. This is also, uh, would be my next question to Tyson. Um, so Natalia, you have already uh, mentioned that that's also, it's not only about Ukraine, um, the digital infrastructure, but it's also uh, so Ukrainian companies are uh, very much involved in cooperation with other bigger companies. And that's my question to you. Uh, so what is at stake for the West uh, if Ukraine's IT sector were to, to collapse or to have many troubles? Uh, well, honestly, I don't think that there's any chance that the that Ukraine's IT infrastructure or IT sector is going to collapse. I mean, it is the most resilient uh, sector in the Ukrainian economy. It is uh, something, we're talking about digital services that is not necessarily territorially defined. So it's very different than say the agriculture sector or manufacturing, which are much more sensitive to the kinetic effects of this war. Uh, we're talking about mainly human capital. And I think it's good to point out that, you know, the resilience remains. I mean, one company <laughs> that jumps out at me because I watch YouTube videos is Grammarly, which obviously advertises a lot on YouTube, which is a, a Ukrainian unicorn, uh, which helps us all improve our writing uh, with a, about a 13 billion euro valuation. Um, you know, Ukraine before the war was attracting 27% of its inbound FDI into its software and IT sector. Uh, making sure that that can continue is, is extremely important. That is a geopolitical priority. It should be for uh, Europe and the United States, um, because this sector is going to be the sector that lifts Ukraine to recovery. Um, because it is the most resilient and it's the one that can operate most easily in the international economy, even during this during this war. Um, so I am not, I mean, we, we still need to watch this, but I think that this is a sector that we can really invest in. And, um, you mentioned, what can we do to support that? I mean, 
uh, you know, the United States has these uh, major tech companies which are already, uh, you know, working in partnership with the government. Uh, that needs to kind of create connective tissue with the private sector in Ukraine itself. I think that that's happening. And Europe is doing its part as well and with the assets that it has, you know, um, uh, inviting, for example, um, the Ukrainian telecommunications company uh, into Barrick. Uh, to participate in telecommunications regulation. So starting the digital accession process for Ukraine, uh, you know, easing, uh, we know Europe as, is uh, very well known for roaming, uh, lifting roaming charges, lifting roaming charges for Ukraine, making sure that that connectivity can still exist so that even for IT specialists, both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine can continue to have the kind of development ecosystem that they would have in peacetime. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Natalia. Um, over to you. Um, what are the long-term prospects uh, of IT industry in Ukraine? Uh, and also, maybe you can uh, comment what um, just uh, Tyson said. How um, how do you see these prospects? And uh, if it, uh, help uh, coming from the West is enough, or uh, there is um, a need to do more? And also, could you please outline the role of uh, the project in in the long-term uh, prospects of the IT industry? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Let's start from what uh, Tyson said. I, I just wanted to ask you to have some words in this uh, on, on this topic because I saw the numbers uh, for February and for March and numbers. Just a second, I will show this. And the uh, for February. 2022, the industry reached the highest monthly indicator of export in its history. So uh, for February, we had uh, $839 million. So it, this is absolute maximum from the ver very beginning of IT in Ukraine. And if we uh, look at the March numbers, uh, Ukrainian IT industry managed somehow uh, to keep 96% uh, of computer service experts. It's uh, $522 million. And uh, if we are, uh, it's, it, it's really great numbers. So in total from, uh, from, the, uh, from the beginning of the year for the first quarter, we had um, uh, export, uh, we had just a second, we had a 2 billion US dollars. So in spite of the fact that we have a full scale invasion right now, basically we call it war, the IT industry still uh, do what uh, it did before the war stay strong and uh, demonstrate us an amazing result. And, uh, you know, uh, we are in the 24-7 in the contact with the IT companies and uh, what I heard from them, even now during the war, some of them somehow uh, managed to, to, to receive new contracts with new clients. So, of course, the negotiation uh, were started before the war, but they were finalized right now during the war. And I think it's, a, it's, it's really good. And I really don't think that something bad will happen with the IT industry, industry uh, in spite of the fact of the war. Of course, uh, they need support. Of course, we uh, do what we can to do for them. Of course, we attract... Um, we're trying to attract investments uh, in IT because uh, many, many companies, if we're, if we're talking about investments, uh, a lot of product companies and the product companies are, will be our main focus because uh, during our kind of strategic session with the IT, IT industry representatives, we as a ministry uh, decided to uh, to make uh, our uh, to to create uh, to have as a, our main focus it's a, a transition uh, I, Ukrainian IT from uh, out, uh, from servicing to uh, to product and the product companies startups uh, right now uh, they have a lack of investments but anyway uh, they still uh, they still keep uh, working and trying to to attract investments thank you. 
Thank you, Natalia. Um, actually, I have many other questions, uh, but I would like to give the opportunity uh, to ask the question of our guests and the audience. I would firstly encourage uh, to raise your hand and uh, maybe to switch on your camera to join the conversation. And um, so otherwise, uh, we can go, of course, to the questions and comments. Um, in the chat, but first of all, uh, feel free just to raise your hand. You don't need to switch on your camera if you just like, you know, just wake up and uh, <laughs> need a bit more time. Um, okay, I, I don't see any hands yet, uh, but I see uh, several comments uh, coming from um, Kostiantin Carson. Um, uh, Mr. Carson, uh, maybe you could just, you know, summarize or just bring your points uh, to, to our guests and maybe say to, to whom uh, you want to raise the question. Um, I see a lot of comments on the report, so maybe uh, their comments and questions go to Anatoly directly, but uh, if you'd like to, uh, to say it in person would be just great. Okay, it's not the case. I see, um, Anatoly, uh, could you please comment uh, on, on questions of Mr. Carson? Uh, I, I would not like to read them out because I think everybody can see the questions and just uh, uh, to save time, um, Anatoly, um, would you like to comment on that? I'm, I'm muted, yeah. So uh, <laughs> thank you for this. I, I, so first, the number of volunteers a uh, Fedor mentioned 300,000. Uh, uh, previously, he mentioned 500,000. So maybe this number changes because I believe that at the beginning of the war, it was more people engaged and uh, even from the professional side, uh, as I know from the IT specialists. Uh, I, and uh, uh, so again, the, the numbers, it's hundreds of thousands of people and it's uh, still very impressive. Uh, the Ministry of Digital Transformation launched hundreds of applications, websites, could you please list all of them? I, I assume that the ministry will do it. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot uh, do it on their behalf. Um, uh, and the, uh, about, the, about the personal data. So they're doing the best to, to protect the, the, the personal data. I mean, the Ministry of Digital Transformation. I, I agree that uh, the, cyber the level of cybersecurity is not a, the same level as we have in, in a, a wealthy Western countries, but still they're doing their best. And also for the last two years, they have a very significant reforms in this sphere. A, I, I, as far as I know, the fund of $50 million before the a Russian invasion was allocated by USAID uh, to develop the uh, cybersecurity protection measures. And uh, it's true that it's far from being perfect, but uh, first, uh, what they're doing with the registry, as far as I know, registry uh, integration and the protection is, is a great job. Uh, but still, I think that they, that could be a leak. And also, we know that a couple of months before the Russian invasion, a uh, Russian hackers attacked the um, the uh, uh, I think healthcare database, and they said that even I think that's even part of the it partially was deleted, uh, and and then it took some time to recover. And I'm not sure, absolutely convinced that it was uh, recovered in full. So it will take some time, and it's a, it's it's going to be done amidst uh, the the military aggression. Uh, and uh, I, I agree that it's uh, far from being perfect. Uh, they're going in the right direction, and they're also instructed by a, a US and UK um, experts in cybersecurity sphere. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it, 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 uh, eventually it, it will work. But uh, if any Ukrainian could be uh, feel protected with his personal data, uh, again, I'm not sure that it, it's the case these days. Uh, and uh, also, it, it's been that uh, said that significant changes were made to Ukrainian legislation and some amendments to 361, 361. One, uh, again, I'm, I know quite well about the impact of DSCT reform. I, I, I couldn't say that uh, I, it's, it's, it's significant uh, is on tax burden by in terms of absolute numbers, but again, it's, it's the right spirit and the right direction of uh, understanding by the government that they should ease for this uh, sector that actually today has the biggest contribution to the overall revenues of the country, especially when the, uh, the production plants are bombed. 
I think that it's the right direction. And the, uh, as far as I talk to the representatives of the IT industry in the country, uh, they're quite satisfied with those, uh, with those amendments and those changes. We have some also questions by, you know, Oksana Prikhotko, uh, and I think it's too deep for me. <laughs> Uh, and uh, because it's about the specific details of the Ukraine of, of the legislation, so uh, I think that maybe Natalia who could have later on comments uh, on this specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Constantin raised uh, his hand. So, um, um, I think you would you like to come in? Mm -hmm. Please. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello. Thank you for reading my questions. Uh, my name is Kostantin Korsun. I'm a cybersecurity expert and I, uh, since 2000, so my experience in cybersecurity, in practical cybersecurity is 22 years and I cannot understand some points in, in this report. I was very surprised when I read it, uh, especially related to high level of cyber protection of pub public data. It's not true. I'm sorry, either it's my internet connection or um, Mr. Corson, your internet connection is very unstable. I can't really ah, understand. Can you hear me right now? Is it only my problem or also other? Ah, yes, but I guess your internet connection is quite unstable. Okay. Maybe you will write your comment because your internet connection is quite unstable. Okay, let's give me a minute to switch on, off. Did okay, he... we will. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it is internet con connection because I hear him perfectly. Mr. Kostin, would you like to go ahead with your comment? Okay, okay. Now it seems it. I I hope you now you can see and hear me. Uh so uh, back to my words. Um, I was very surprised in some some reading some point in in this report, especially related to cybersecurity. Uh, extreme uh, improvement uh, in, and uh, better protection of public services, uh, etc. It's not true, actually. The protection of public data, government data, and many other data uh, are still very, very low. And government is not prof not professional enough to improve the, this area very fast within during the war and within last few months it, it couldn't possible uh, many years ago uh, and now it's very very difficult to do right now because before they were the, the level of protection was very low and a lot of leaks it uh, uh, we could see approved it uh, additionally uh, about cyber leg legislation Ukrainian cyber legislation is is not working it's it's very poor. Uh, it does. It doesn't reflect actual reality and obligation and and, and many, many other things. Uh, and uh, as, as you mentioned, something about that that uh, change, uh, total change in tax policy. It's not true. Uh, total changes in cybersecurity area. It's not true. Uh, very weak cyber uh, legislation existing in, in Ukraine. So. Uh, it's, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Carson. Uh, um, I think we got your point, and I, I think our speakers could comment on that. Um, I'm very sorry for switching off my camera because my internet connection is not stable. Um, thanks so much, um, Anatoly, Natalia, Tyson. Feel free to comment um, on on Mr. Carson's um, intervention. So if if I may just jump in for the I'm I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but I do understand about the special the DSCT regime, and I think yes, it was a significant reform. And uh, I, according to Michael, and the, we have quite extensive uh, network in Silicon Valley and the and with the those companies who are active in Ukraine, and we have uh, hundreds of companies who joined this uh, special regime. So it demonstrates that and they do it voluntarily. They could uh, remain. In the in the in the in the conditions that they used to work in in Ukraine, it, it demonstrates that just that uh, the, this regime works. It's attractive, and also the you know the, the number of uh, the, the revenues that they got to Ukraine as a result of this 
a regime introduction, I just talk to it for themselves. So I think that it's a, it, it was just unfair about the cybersecurity measures. I, I'm not a, a professional enough to, to reply. I would like to add uh, about the city as a uh, head of the city project office. I was uh, involved in this project uh, from the very beginning till the uh, till the time where the uh, draft laws uh, were adopted by uh, Ukrainian parliament. And uh, I don't know if you are aware of not, but uh, the launch of the city was uh, eight of uh, eight or seventh of February, so just two weeks before the war. And from uh, for uh, first uh, two weeks, we had something around uh, 60 or 65 residents. Right now, we have 200 and almost and almost 70. And each day, company are going to become a resident to add uh, themselves to the city uh, special legal and tax regime. So basically, we see that. Uh, for companies, for IT companies, for big IT companies, it's uh, really still in, it's still interesting, and they are going to see uh, themselves in the DS city. Again, uh, from the very beginning of this project, we were developing uh, this project uh, with the IT industry representatives. So we uh, really understood that uh, the final beneficiaries of this project are IT companies. So on 95%, the laws were drafted by the, the intentions and uh, by intentions of uh, IT companies. So it's not something that we decided to do and somehow did. It's absolutely the, we created these initiatives on demand of the IT industry and the quantity of our residents uh, demonstrates uh, that us that, uh, that uh, it was a good idea and we, are, uh, we realized this idea uh, in a proper way. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, let's move to another uh, question. And I see one from Oksana Prihodka um, and another one from uh, Raina Adam. I just uh, will mention them quickly and yes, speakers feel free to, to comment and answer. So um, Oksana Prihodka asked, um, did you analyze what happens with internet unique identificators in the time of war? For example, in the temporary occupied territories. And there's also a question on, on the EU regulations. Um, so maybe Tyson could take this. Um, and uh, Reiner Adam uh, asked about uh, the uh, Moya Vina um, uh, cooperation partners. Um, so maybe he could also answer that. Um, yeah, I think we we can we could take this uh, three questions. We have uh, nine minutes left, and um, who would like to to answer the question from Roxana Prihodko? I'm I'm happy to uh, to start. Just a couple of uh, uh, quick uh, observations. First of all, I very technically worded I have to say, but essentially this is referring to the regulation governing uh, sanctions against Russia uh, that were of course first imposed. Uh, after the Euromaidan and the annexation of Crimea and then have since been expanded. And uh, those sanctions applied to the occupied territories of Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea do include restrictions on investment in telecommunications infrastructure, data centers, et cetera. And I assume that the question is how will this apply to uh, occupied territories currently under occupation uh, as Russia uh, gains territory and of course uh, starts to um, attempt digital annexation of, of these territories by linking them to uh, uh, Russian uh, mobile network uh, operator infrastructure. Um, I am not aware and perhaps somebody else is that that would apply because this is much more related to territory as defined in earlier sanctions packages. And in fact, as far as I know, but this is slightly speculative, um, I think that there is attempts to try to contest um, you know, connectivity in those spaces, uh, including through low earth orbit satellites and, and uh, on the ground uh, equipment that uh, Star uh, Starlink has been issuing, as well as you know, the use of VPNs and, and other closed messaging access infrastructure. So I don't know how much, um, I, don't, I wouldn't assume that you know, sanctions that were ascribed to Crimea and Dine occupied territories in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, would apply to any territory that Russia just advances into. 
Um, on the point, somebody mentioned, um, uh, uh, you know, that Ukraine is not signed up to the Council of Europe uh, Convention uh, 108, that is, uh, or 108 plus, which is the subsequent uh, uh, protocols governing data protection, which started in the in the 80s. I wasn't aware that Ukraine was not uh, signed up. I mean, clearly, data protection is a a central value uh, in the government governance of uh, digital space in Europe. And of course, getting high personal data protection standards in place for Ukraine is going to be part of its journey to uh, European integration. So that that's surprising to me. But when we're talking about the question of, you know, the, uh, the level of cybersecurity in public administration systems, and I have to say, watching from the outside, and I'm not an expert, but watching from the outside, I have been very impressed at the level of digitization the public administration in Ukraine has gone through in the past three years since uh, the, uh, the announcement of this plan around DIA and um, the smart smartphone infrastructure in, in 2019. That has been fast. Um, it, of course, there's going to be need for, um, you know, uh, evaluation, uh, assessment, and uh, risk assessment, and, and improvement. But sitting in Germany, where there's a big debate about digitization of public administration, uh, sovereign cloud usage, uh, digital identities, etc., I can say Ukraine has has leapfrogged over over Germany in this in this regard. And perhaps there are there's a good space for dialogue on equal footing in that in that area. One last point I would say is, you know, and I'm not trying to carry water for any company. But a lot of the hyperscalers, a lot of the cloud service providers would say, you know, the best way to protect uh, cybersecurity in Ukraine, as has been demonstrated, is to think about cloud resilience. You know, there has been talk about moving public uh, administration data into the UK. Hyperscalers have a, a vast array of risk mitigation, both technical, political and financial risk mitigation uh, systems in place and creating uh, trusted uh, trustee relationships with telcos and hyperscalers might be one way to to move that forward to increase that cyber uh, protection in Ukraine. Thanks a lot, Tyson. Um, uh, Natalia, are you still with us? Uh, would you like to comment on, on, on any questions or on what just Tyson said? I'm afraid as Anatolia, I'm not too deep in this topic. So if we are talking no about IT industry development, IT industry support, DSC and IT business relate, uh, related uh, questions and issue, <laughs> it was pleasure. Then, but <laughs> then, then it will be another question to you. I and maybe first with, with Anatoly on the uh, question about uh, Moyavina uh, cooperation partners. Do you know something? I, yeah, I already uh, asked for a, for a personal email and I got it. So I, I promised an, an answer because I need to check it out with them. I, whom precisely are they cooperating? I know that they do, I, but I want to be precise. So I promise to send a personal answer. Great. Um, if we don't have any questions from the audience, I would just uh, like ask uh, Natalia uh, to maybe shortly come in and uh, again ask her about maybe the main urgent tasks uh, for her minister now uh, and maybe for the long term prospects, uh, what she expect, expects from, from Germany, from the EU, maybe from the United States. Uh, thank you, Alona. Uh, I just uh, th thank you very much for this discussion. I just want to emphasize that um as i uh, told you at the very beginning of this meeting in spite of the fact of the war we uh, the ministry is still going to reach our uh, four uh, main goals so we keep operating in almost the uh, pre-war regime and still, in spite of the fact that we have uh, a new activities and new tasks because of the war, we are going to, uh, we are going to reach our goal, which is 100% uh, of public services available to citizens and business online, 95% of the population, social facilities and major highways and roads are covered with uh, high-speed internet and uh, um, six million uh, Ukrainians have upgraded their digital skills and the main one for me personally, because I am more or less responsible for this area, is 10% share of IT in the country's GDP. 
so uh, we are doing all these activities and uh, attracting partners and attracting a donor organization to, to realize these activities. Again, uh, if we are talking about um, support right now, uh, what we really need, we, uh, we, 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 we spoke a lot today about, um, about uh, uh, how to, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I just another call and, and messaging. So we, we spoke a lot uh, how to, to uh, explain uh, for international companies to leave Russia, to stop paying taxes and sponsoring the war and killing Ukrainian people. So we know right now a lot of examples when companies in the public sphere said that, uh, of course, we left Russia, we stopped doing business there, we stopped financing war, but then uh, internal and not only internal investigation demonstrates us that companies uh, violate uh, sanctions and so on. So we definitely need to help of the international uh, international organizations uh, and all the society to to unveil such situation and uh, help us to, to to stop the activity in in Russia. Uh, again, uh, we have a lot of an amazing projects uh, uh, which are about the education because uh, I, we, we haven't talked about this uh, today. A lot of, uh, as for now, 10 million people in Ukraine had to leave their homes F and, uh, and now we call them temporarily moved. So they need to find a new job. For many of them, they have to find new profession. They have to adapt uh, to a new reality. And as Anatoly mentioned in his report, we just yesterday, by the way, we launched our new amazing project, which we call uh, not IT Nation, but uh, since yesterday it's IT Generation. We want to educate uh, many people who lost their job, who decided to find themselves in IT, because uh, still, uh, IT is uh, almost one industry which still hires people. Of course, it's not the uh, 30,000 uh, as it was before the war, but right now we open some sources like, uh, anyway, we have in Ukraine a lot of sources where uh, company are uh, searching for IT specialists and still there are uh, a high demand, uh, less than uh, 10,000, but something around uh, between nine and 10,000 IT specialists specialist in spite of the fact of the war right now. So we want, uh, we want the project, uh, the first 1,000 uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, will be uh, will uh, have the IT education. The program will start uh, in the middle of uh, August, and uh, I do hope that uh, will be finished uh, till the end of the year because the latency of the program not less than six months. So uh, it's it's our first step. It's our MVP. We still need money to to educate 2,000 people. And uh, this program, by the way, this program was uh, presented by the uh, Prime Minister of Ukraine and to the President uh, of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. And both of them uh, approved this program. And now we are talking about to, uh, to make this program uh, to to put this program on the national level. So uh, now our goal is to educate in IT, re-educate. This program is only for adult people who already has a profession, but re-educate uh, 60,000 uh, Ukrainians. So uh, this support by donors organization or by business will be highly, uh, highly appreciated because uh, the first thousand of people we uh, started to, to teach with our partner from business. It's a worldwide uh, famous uh, crypt, uh, cryptocurrency company, Binance. And uh, right now we have a lot of negotiations with the potential uh, donors and potential partners in this project. Uh, and why it's good, because it's not only educate people, but uh, support a local IT education company, which is uh, quite a lot on, on the, in the Ukraine even now.
Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so I see it's not only about like maintaining uh, the digital infrastructure, not only helping people, but also a lot of activities uh, for the future. So we're already now uh, investing in people and education. Uh, just just great to see how much you're doing for that also. Uh, I wish we had more time uh, to discuss this super interesting topic and so many uh, different sides of that. Uh, but unfortunately, it's already 11.3. Uh, so and I, I, I had to stop this discussion. Uh, but we have to, to go to other appointments and I just wanted to thank all your all, all our speakers and, and the audience for this very very interesting discussion and I hope we can continue it in other formats and yeah that, that's all for me I, I wish you a very good day thanks for joining thank us you. and all the best bye bye <laughs>